Hi, my name is Adam Davis. I am the founder and the manager of Amalgamated Vision. Uh, before I begin, I just want to take a moment to thank Dan Varghese, Chanel, the other organizers of uh, this meeting for their kind invitation uh, to speak tonight. I'd like to thank everyone in the audience for coming out tonight as well. Uh, this presentation will discuss head-mounted display. It's a little different than what we've seen before because this is the technology that makes it happen. Is that a little better? So this is the technology that makes it all happen, and I think we should take a deep dive into exactly what we're using uh, when we talk about uh, extended reality in healthcare. So before I begin, let's just start it off with a video. The thing that the HoloLens gives you is the ability to walk around those 3D objects and to really experience them as if they're in the room with you. We just augment but the digital content is inserted into the room as if it's actually there. Is it In the most forward-looking educational programs, HoloLens is a key part of this. The actual act of dissection hasn't changed in generations. HoloLens is going to enable us to teach in an integrated way and to look at the body in ways they haven't been able to see it. It's sort of having x-ray vision, seeing through the skin. Let's take a step back. Okay, let's ask ourselves the question, is mixed reality the most appropriate medium for this particular task, and that is learning anatomy? So we all know that mixed reality has been shown to enhance anatomic learning and task performance, uh, basically because of increased comprehension of complex spatial relationships and shapes. But in this particular case, augmented reality provides no better, or mixed reality, provides no greater advantage than using virtual reality or even using a stereoscopic monitor. In fact, in mixed reality, the superimposition of background on your objects is generally distracting to the user. And in that case, something in immersive environments such as virtual reality, a monitor, or a tablet may be better for this kind of focused attention task. And I ask you, if you would not read a textbook using mixed reality, uh, then why would you use it to study anatomy? It's not necessarily the best tool, even though we just saw a video that tells us all about how we can apply it to learning anatomy. This is a slightly different uh, way of doing it, and this is just simply immersive. This is virtual reality for doing the same task, learning anatomy. Now, please remember, we weren't seeing actual patients. Everything we're looking at now are graphic images. This is illustration. So this is an HTC Vive, this is Organon, and what immediately what jumps out is the clarity of what you're looking at, the detail of the anatomy. We see that we have the uh, menu, the drop-down menus, the tools that you can use. You can even see how that you can move these minute details around. This works for learning anatomy. You could immerse yourself in this and really get this better experience. This is a second scenario. So now we are in the OR. We're with the surgeon. He's going to use uh, mixed reality to review patient images. And you would think that this is the scenario in which we would use mixed reality. So uh, this is a HoloLens 1. The surgeon is putting it on. You can look at his environment. It's filled with all sorts of medical equipment in the operating room. And you can see that the surgeon has brought up an MRI of this patient's brain. It's a 3D volume acquisition. And you can see he's using a clip plane to move through the volume in order to interrogate it and find the area of interest. So the first thing you have to realize is this is also a graphic illustration. You are not seeing this through the HoloLens. This is an artist telling you what you think the surgeon would be seeing. So this has the same exact downside as what we saw before. All of this background is superimposed over this anatomy. So we have to ask, is this an appropriate medium for reviewing this patient imaging data? And the answer is no. This is 2D or 3D, uh, non-stereoscopic 3D volume rendered data. In this particular instance, but which doesn't require spatial co-registration or any of the advantages of mixed reality, there is no advantage to using a mixed reality headset as opposed to using a monitor. 
We're using virtual reality. This is a different take. This is also patient data, and this is an immersive, a virtual reality moment. And this is Dr. Philip Catan, and he is in Basel, Switzerland. That's a CT of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis, and you can see he's using a clip plane with an HTC Vive and a controller, and you can see him move through the anatomy. And you can see the, the difference between those. Yes, of course, this is a different, uh, uh, different volume rendering, but here he is using a clip plane to use a multi-planar reformat. Now he's using it to change the shading and the lighting. The same thing you can do on any kind of 3D stereoscopic uh, monitors or any kind of workstation. But this shows you that that reviewing of patient data, even though they like to show it in this augmented reality sense and it is marketed as being a, uh, a uh, more uh, appropriate environment for doing such sophisticated things that surgeons do in the OR, in actuality, the medium is not appropriate for the task. Now, I'm not down on mixed reality. I love mixed reality. It just needs to be the right indication. These are my friends at Metavis. This is a patient in the OR. His head is uh, in a, a head holder. Uh, they're preparing him for brain surgery. And superimposed on the head, looking through a hollow lens, is the MRI uh, with contrast material. And they're using the clip plane to move through the head, which is spatially co-registered to the patient, in order to get a better idea of where this tumor lies. Now, the surgeon obviously knows before he goes to the OR what he's doing, but when you do this, it helps you plan the craniotomy. You get a better idea of where you're going to make the incision. kind of gives you an idea of the dissection. That is a great indication for mixed reality. We have to think about what we're using and what we're talking about when we say extended reality and healthcare. We tend to just lump it all together in this, you know, in this large pile and we don't dissect it out. So let's step back for a second and take a look at the different ways in which we look at data sets in medicine. So there are really two broad indications for medicine, health, and wellness. The first, extended reality can be used to convey data. And by convey data, this is uh, information such as uh, radiologic imaging, text, graphics, illustrations that help the practitioner practice or learn, but it is not part of the therapeutic process. You're using your headset in order to get information. The second category is you are using XR as a medium to treat disease, and we've discussed that now several times during this symposium. Pain reduction, anxiety relief, addiction, psychotherapy, VR or the MR, is part of the therapeutic process. This presentation right now is going to concern extended reality to facilitate real-time medical practice, and that is the first, to convey data. And that is a very different world than using it as a medium to treat disease. You have to think about what you're doing with it, and you have the purpose and you have the content, and they nicely break down into simple groups. It's not that complicated. So the objectives of, of uh, why you're using XR, well, you want to create spatial or situational awareness, right? Co-registration, things like that, surgical guidance. You want to improve spatial uh, the comprehension, complex spatial relationships, and that helps with the diagnosis. Okay, when you see 3D in these environments, you can help have a better idea of looking at a patient's data or something like that. Uh, I meant a patient's radiologic imaging or something like that. Um, XR gives you portable personal information, EMT, nursing anesthesia. You can have vital signs. You can see physiologic monitoring. That's another way of using it. You carry it with you. You have telemedicine, which was referred to a little bit earlier. Telemedicine is a remote uh, virtual expert who you can do consultation with. It's a very powerful mechanism and it's actually will probably be a very large field one day. The last is simulation and we saw that as well. Training. Training for a code. Training for uh, procedures and other types of emergencies. Those are the five basic purposes that you can use it for. Then you think about the content and it only breaks down to three things. First, you have radiologic imaging. DICOM. DICOM is the industry standard that all vendors share in order to 
look at uh, radio radiologic data sets. It's the most common spatial information used in clinical medicine. Overwhelmingly, that is the top data set, spatial data set that is being used. Data, text, characters, icons, non-spatial information for evaluation and decision making, a patient chart, physiologic monitoring, an EKG or something like that. That is data. And the last, which we see a lot of, overwhelmingly more than anything else, even though it is used the least in actuality in medicine, is illustration for training, for learning anatomy, things of that nature. Ask yourself, when you see this medical data, is the content patient-specific? It either is or it isn't. If it's patient-specific, um, we're in the second category. Real-time medical practice utilizes data generated by and applied to a particular individual, patient-specific data. The first category is a product which has illustrative graphic content created for a particular software application and a particular purpose, and for that, the content doesn't change in between users. In this lecture, again, we're going to be dealing with two, real-time medical practice. On the left, uh, this is using a mixed reality headset. On the left, you see an EMT. He is at an emergency. This is simulated, of course. He's at an emergency. The patient is lying down, and he is getting his real-time information in his visual field to help him with this situation. The only problem is, is that the patient in the situation are entirely obscured by all of the iconic and graphic data that he is being given. And this is the elephant in the room that, for some reason, nobody wants to talk about. On the right, we have the anesthesiologist looking over the curtain at the surgeons down at the surgical field. And what does he see? He sees the vital signs projected onto his visual field. VR, AR, MR hardware is obstructive to the visual field and except for certain specific indications, is not well suited to most healthcare practice. There, I said it. Just a little historical uh, vignette. Uh, this paper was published in Anesthesia and, uh, Anesthesia and Analgesia. And uh, what they did was they gave anesthesiologists regular monitors to use, or they gave them a head mounted display to show them the patient's data. And this head mounted display was much simpler. It wasn't uh, an MRAR headset, it was the um, equivalent now of what you would consider a small display. Um, by the way, also for historical convergence, uh, they used a uh, Microvision Nomad for this purpose. The uh, man who ran the company that brought this product to market is actually sitting here in the audience, Alex Tokman. Just a little shout out there. So this paper showed something very interesting. By letting the anesthesiologist see patient data without always being tethered to their monitors, what they found was when participants using head-mounted display compared with standard monitoring, they spent less time looking at the anesthesia workstation and more time looking at the patient in the surgical field. Old school, simple, huge clinical benefit. It brings us to the essential question, what do practitioners need and what can XR offer? So, one, nearly all medical imaging is reference display. It is 2D or 3D content that a, that a practitioner refers to for information. Two, providers need display that provides relevant information in a portable, available, hands-free format that doesn't interfere with their workflow or their patient contact. And we just heard that before. When we said, what do you want to know about the future? Uh, Jake, I believe, said, uh, doctors don't want to wear large uh, HMDs that interferes with their workflow. And that is true because it basically nobody uses it currently. Three, immersion and spatial co-registration are always cited as the chief benefit of extended reality HMD. But it's actually the stereoscopic experience of all of those displays that it's the single largest impact. Let's take a second and talk about stereoscopy. It, it is the fundamental element of using 
mixed reality, augmented reality, and virtual reality. So I'll just spend a, a few seconds talking about it to familiarize people who may not be aware of stereoscopy. And basically, the different position of a single viewed object on each retina is interpreted as distance from the eye. You look at something, it has a slightly different position on each eye. Your brain says, ah, it must be this far away. How significant is it? It is the most powerful and accurate visual cue in under two meters. All people use stereoscopy up to two meters to tell where things are. The mechanism of stereoscopy is the same, and that's the beauty of it. No matter what device you use, they're all based on the same thing. You take two slightly uh, different, uh, the same object rotated slightly, projected to each eye individually, and that produces the stereoscopic experience. So you have two objects, and you can see they are slightly different. You can see that this edge is a little further from the two than this edge because they're rotated by six degrees, seven degrees. And if you did, anybody in the audience, if you can crush your eyes, put them together into one image, you're going to see it pop out of you. That's stereoscopy. And when you do that, your brain says, ah, this must be a 3D image. It has that depth to it. Stereoscopy is not new in medicine. I know we'd like to think that we are now cutting edge by bringing AR, VR, and MR into the world of medicine. But in the 1950s, radiologists were shooting x-rays stereos with stereoscopy. They would do two chest x-rays at slightly different degrees. They'd use prism glasses, and they would see these chest x-rays or abdominal radiographs with depth in three, in three dimensions. So why did they stop using it? Because Basically, CT came along, in the, uh, computer demography came along in the 1970s and squashed that idea. But it's always been around the idea of using stereoscopy. It's a proven technique for conveying complex information. There are lots of studies now using stereoscopy, stereoscopic monitors, using headsets. And what it shows is that that was done in radiology, ophthalmology, all the surgical subspecialties. And they all show the same exact thing. One. Easier to identify and differentiate objects within a complex visual scene, improved diagnostic performance. One. Two, it is stereoscopic training improves task performance and you have a faster acquisition of skills. And lastly, the impact is biggest on high complexity tasks and on novices. If you already know what you're doing, training in stereoscopy doesn't help you. If you have no idea what you're doing, Stereoscopy has a huge impact. Makes sense. The interesting thing, to bring this entire history now to the current day, is that studies show that it is the quality of stereoscopy that correlates with the quality of virtual reality presence. They're all in the same thing. There's nothing magical about the presence of VR. It's that stereoscopic feeling that you have. So this is our universe in medicine. We have all of these competing data sets in all of these different formats. And the question is, how do we bring these all together? How do we think about all of this? So when I think about the universe of HMD and VR and AR, I basically think of it as three points in the spectrum. There is reference display, which is your, your phone or a tablet. There's virtual reality, which we're all familiar with, HTC Vive. And then there's mixed reality. And mixed reality is that spatial co-registration of your objects into the field around you. And augmented reality falls in between the two because it's more fixed. It doesn't stay with your environment. And all the devices that you can think of fall within that spectrum. And it's only broken down by, are these devices, oh, where are we? Is that working? Do you have real world awareness? Do you have full immersion? Is it handheld or is it wearable? But that's it. Everything will fall into those areas. How do we capture both segments of this healthcare data spectrum in one HMD format? How do we take all of those competing data sets and competing paradigms and then bring them together so that we can unify them and have a, 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 a HMD that not only gives this to us, but also maintains awareness. 
And that's really the HMD, the Head Mounted Display Holy Grail. We want low profile, high image quality, stereoscopic, non-obstructive to the visual field. We want to display medical content in any format, maintain environmental awareness, and it's got to be ergonomically acceptable so that you can use it all day long. portable display. And we also understood the, uh, the problems with the current uh, types of stereoscopy, and that was 15 years ago with all the different headsets that were available, or even prism glasses or red-green filters. Um, as well as the industry evolved, the problems with the headsets that were coming out because they were amazing pieces of technology. The only problem was absolutely nobody was using them. We fell upon a technology that we thought was well suited towards head mounted display and visualization. And this was basically laser MEMS, microelectrical mechanical system. Laser MEMS, if you're not familiar with it, it takes about one second to explain. The concept is very simple. This is a video from an Israeli company, Maradin. You have a mirror that goes back and forth and up and down. It is synced with three lasers. It produces light. Uh, the lasers produce a light. It bounces off the mirror, and the mirror goes back and forth and up and down, and it paints a picture on a surface, very much like a cathode ray tube on an old TV set. And this can be used for uh, barcode scanning or the projection on a wall. But we thought to ourselves, this is a pretty good light source. Why don't we take this light source and instead of projecting it on a wall, why don't we just project it directly into the eye? Not the first person to think of that. Virtual retinal display, okay? The image is painted directly on the retina. There's no screen. There's no intermediary. You have an image right on the retina. Okay, and that was developed at the University of Washington then carried over into commercialization by multiple companies. So we thought, why can't we do this? And the problem is, is because it's not a trivial optical problem to take a laser and squeeze it through the pupil and get it onto the retina. You can do it, but you're only going to see about one or two degrees of your field of view. So we worked on this problem for a while and used a relay lens using a laser MEMS mirror and certain types of relay lenses, and we were able to squeeze a laser through onto the back of the eye. And through further uh, evolution of the product and optimization, uh, we were able to move on to using pancake lenses. And a pancake lens is um, actually an old idea, but it's never been applied with laser light for this. And when we put this all together, we realized that the performance that we were getting from this system was really quite high. And the beauty of it was that the form factor was really quite small. And we could take this device and we could put it right on the face. Okay? When we say that this is close to the eye, we're talking less than 16 millimeters. The only thing that prevents us from getting closer is your eyelashes are hitting the cornea. Laser light provides extreme brilliance. It allows visualization in bright environments. You know that's the bugaboo of HMD. You walk outside, you don't see it anymore. Pancake relays fold the optical path into a very small space, and not only does it give you a compact form, it can also give you a wide field of view. This is not possible with waveguide technology sits out from your eye. And you all know waveguide technology because it is the technology that is used by almost every manufacturer okay, in the world. There are a couple of uh, outliers who use laser light, a couple of pinholes, but I would say more than 95% of manufacturers and all the major manufacturers use waveguide technology. The lenses can be extremely close to the eye. And why is that a benefit? Well, it's obviously you don't want things right up to your eye, but if they're that close to the eye, you can just rest them on the face. You don't need a big head apparatus anymore. You just have something small that sits on your face and you can look at it. So um, these are just some drawings, and you can see this is what uh, the technology looks like. Ah, let's go back. Sorry. Uh, this is what the technology looks like superimposed on a concept uh, pair of glasses. 
Uh, this is just a 3D drawing of some of the optical designs. And you can see this is a 3D print, and there's a corner. Okay? So that is the optomechanics contained within there. Yes, you're going to need batteries and, and, and chips and all sorts of things to drive that and move that, but that doesn't need to be on the front of your face. That can be separate from it, and the light can move through the fiber optic device. But the thing that produces the light, instead of using a waveguide, sits inside that tube. So it's inside that little box. This is Michael Abrash. This is in 2018, and uh, this was uh, one of our patents back to 2016. So everybody was converging on this idea of pancake compact folding lenses to bring everything smaller and create that field of view. And what's interesting is they didn't put it together. I'm sure they have, but at the time they didn't because they were saying, imagine AR glasses that are socially acceptable. If those glasses existed today, we'd be wearing them right now. Technology hasn't advanced to the point where AR glasses can be made small enough for people to wear all day. So basically, if you that is the design of a pancake lens sitting on a small pair of concept glasses, and that's the entire thing. So if there are engineers in the room, they're going to be skeptical because they're going to say that what is the performance of this system? And that's always been the problem. You can't take stuff, squeeze it down, shoot it in the eye, and expect the performance that you get when you have this nice, large uh, uh, display that wraps around the patient. So what we have shown, and I'm sure others may have shown this too, is that we have binocular inherently stereoscopic display. The ARMR will be provided by a pass-through because looking through glass is not the right way to show somebody information, particularly in healthcare. Image resolution is as good as the human eye. We're not talking pixels. We're not talking 4 or 8K. We are talking resolution matches the eye. It's there. We're done. Can't do any better than that. Field of view 43 by 25. Wide beam obviates need for eye tracking, always in focus because it's a laser. The light doesn't diverge. Unless you have an astigmatism, that image will perfectly be in focus because laser light is always in focus. If you're hyperopic, nearsighted or farsighted, you will always see it. Unsurpassed colors, uh, saturation, intense luminescence, light field capable because you can just change the focus of the laser and make it focus deep or superficial, and you can create light field, which is the, I guess, second holy grail of, of HFD. And lastly, lasers are a very efficient power source, so that's always a benefit. This is, once again, our universe, all right, of all the different competing data sets. And we see that, yes, there are technological solutions that can handle all of these things, and these technological solutions are emerging right now. In conclusion, these are the take-home points. There are the object, uh, excuse me, the purpose, the objective, and the content needed by the healthcare trainee or practitioner determines the HMD format. Don't take a headset and try to make it do everything that people want. Most real-time medical practice is 2D textual and or icons or 3D spatial DICOM. It is not necessary uh, necessarily spatial co-registration. Three, reference display, whether it's stereoscopic or not, constitutes the majority of healthcare use cases. It is the overwhelming dominant use in medicine is looking at an image for reference reasons. Spatial co-registration is extremely important in certain circumstances, but they are much less frequent. And lastly, emerging technologies will change the industry dialogue from see-through AR, MR, to pass through ARMR, and it will start to include the most relevant use case, which is not discussed, which is reference display. That's it. Thank you very much, everyone.